The following podcast is not meant for children or for liberals, even though that's pretty much the same thing these days, but that's what we're here for. Somebody's got to keep these brats in line. Anyway, you've been warned. It's the right opinion. These days, our media is either incompetent or malevolent. They don't believe in heaven, but they acting like they have been sent. Knowing the truth is way harder than telling it. We gotta work harder, gotta be more intelligent. Sometimes we just gotta grab a mic and start yelling shit. We're living in times when it's hard to stay relevant. Be the elephant in the room in a room full of elephants. Be the elephant in the room in a room full of elephants. Boom. Boom. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to The Right Opinion. Dot podbean.com. I, of course, am your host, Harrison Bergeron. Happy to have you all aboard, as always. If you aren't doing so already, maybe you're coming here for the first time because you uh, are interested in hearing what my guest this week has to say. And yes, there is a guest this week. And if you are one of those people coming over here for the first time, check me out at the right opinion.podbean.com, or you could just search the right opinion on Google Play, Stitcher, and uh, iTunes for that matter. There is another. The Right Opinion Podcast, affiliated with the Washington Times. Fuck them. Don't worry about them. You just come on over here. It's the one with the logo that's black and white and red all over like newspapers used to be. And if you aren't doing so already, follow me on Twitter, Parler, Instagram, and Minds. At Right Opinion Pod is how you'll find me on any of those platforms. Also, if you got any questions, comments, concerns, interview guest suggestions, hey, you want to be an interview guest yourself? Got to have a little bit of cred, but... Feel free to hit me up anyway. The right opinion pod at gmail.com is how you do that. And uh, if you follow me on Twitter at right opinion pod, my DMs always open. So if you got any sort of, you know, information you want to slide to me on the sly, you could do it there. Or if you just have a comment about a show that you don't want to be made public, as I actually had last week, uh, the gentleman who messaged me just confirmed how right I was about the LGBT community. I won't give his name because you know, he'll be attacked by his fellow alphabet people, but I appreciate that somebody was willing to listen, and, well, it turned out that they agreed, and I appreciate them keeping an open mind, I appreciate you continuing to listen, and, uh, please keep doing so, and my DMs, again, open, especially for you, so you go ahead and hit me up whenever you'd like, but I mentioned that I have a guest this week, or maybe I didn't, but I'm doing it now, Robert Patrick Lewis is my guest, he's a Special Forces Combat Veteran of Iraq and Afghanistan turned author, entrepreneur, MBA, marketing professional, and investor. He served as an 18D, which is a Special Forces medic, and during his time in uh, in the 10th Special Forces Group, which was the Airborne, he deployed to Afghanistan, Iraq twice, and North Africa, as well as multiple other training missions around the world with a final deployment to Afghanistan as a military contractor. He left the Army with a Purple Heart for wounds received in Afghanistan, the Special Forces tab, the Combat Infantry Badge, the Bronze Star, uh, an Army Commendation Medal, a NATO Non-Article 5, uh, Iraq Campaign Ribbon with Cluster, Afghanistan Campaign Ribbon, and many other rewards, or should I say awards, not rewards, awards for his service. And uh, I, stupid me, forgot to thank him for his service. So Robert, I hope you're listening and thank you for your service. Got a little nervous, man. I was talking to this guy. He's awesome. He's got all this knowledge that I wanted. I was so worried about getting it out of him. I forgot to do the one thing I needed to do, which was thank him for his service. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an ass clown sometimes, but um, nevertheless, I push forward. After his time in uniform was over, Robert set out to write about his experiences. He has published three books, including his nonfiction military memoir, Love Me When I'm Gone, The True Story of Life, Love, and Loss for a Green Beret in post-9-11 war, and two books that are part of a trilogy called The Pact. The first two books are out. The third one, as we'll talk about a little bit in the interview, is to come hopefully in the not-too-distant future, as well as yet another book that he's working on. He's been featured on national programs such as Fox News, The Dennis Miller Show, The Adam Carolla Show, The Herman Cain Show, and writes frequent articles for Heroes Media Group, be sure to check out his three book, uh, his three part book series, The Pact. I just mentioned part one and two are available now in paperback, Kindle, and audiobook. And without further ado, I give to you our first guest here on the Right Opinion Pod, Mr. Robert Patrick Lewis. And here we go. All 
right, folks. This is a this is a first here on the Right Opinion podcast. We have a guest here. Uh, this guest is uh, I gave you all the introduction before, but he's here now, Mr. Robert Patrick Lewis. Uh, he's a, obviously a former Green Beret turned author. He's got a wealth of knowledge about a variety of topics I've always been really interested in. So when I reached out to him on Twitter and he said he's going to come do this interview, I was ecstatic. So here we are, uh, Mr. Lewis. Thank you for coming on to the show here. Hey, thanks for having me. Anytime, man. Like I said, you've got a, a, a myriad of life experience that I that in no way, shape, or form really overlaps any of mine. So I'm going to learn a lot today, I have a feeling. But uh, as I mentioned to the people in the intro, you're a Green Beret turned author. You've got the book series out right now. It's called The Pact. It's a three-parter. You've got the first two parts out. The book has been described as Dan Brown meets Tom Clancy meets Red Dawn. And you obviously have the requisite life experience to write from the perspective of a Green Beret. Um, could you tell the people a little bit about the book and uh, just kind of the plot? I don't want you to obviously give away too much. I want people to go out and buy it. But uh, also, in, while you're doing that, how, how real of a possibility is something like what you have in the book, in your opinion? Well, I, you know, I'm, I wish it was purely fiction. Uh, but that's the thing that we're starting to find out is that if you follow Spygate or if you really are even tuned into the news very much lately, a lot of the stuff that I started writing in 2012 when my, my first book, uh, Love Me When I'm Gone, came out, I started working on the fiction stuff. And it was published in 2014. And in the last year or two, we're starting to find out that it was spot on accurate. Uh, it was just when I finished writing the, uh, the nonfiction book, I went up to Colorado to go meet some of uh, the other guys from my, from my old ODA, my old Special Forces buddy. And we had a party, had some adult beverages, you know, all kind of got to hang out together. We hadn't seen each other for a while. All the wives went to sleep. And so it was the guys sitting around the table, you know, pretty late at night after quite a few drinks. And we just started talking about what we saw, what was going on in the world. And somehow it got to the question of, you know, at this table, we've had guys that were in the Iraq invasion and the Afghan invasion. We've been all over the world, you know, doing what we had to do why hasn't the USA ever been invaded? And so we just started kind of going down that logical train of thought, okay, who would do it? How would they do it? You know, why would they do it? What would be the purpose? And as we talked more and more and more, we started actually making plans. Like, okay, well, what do we do if if that ever happens? Just if we're alive and the USA is ever invaded, what would we do? How would we react? How do we know what's coming? What would be the signs to let us know? And not too long after that, we started actually putting together these plans. We actually have, we have a group and we have, uh, you know, these plans of what we would do if it were ever uh, actually came to that. And as we started going through this and after we started talking, I started looking around at the world and, you know, I just, by, by habit of my former profession, I pay very close attention to global politics, to what's going on in the world, who's fighting with who, who's doing what for resources. And uh, I started realizing that all of our, all the arch enemies in the United States were becoming very close friends. You had Iran and Russia making energy deals, building a pipeline between the two. You had China trying to basically take over all of Africa and the uh, Pacific for natural resources because they have, they don't have nearly enough natural resources to feed, clothe, and arm a billion people. Yeah. Uh, they had within the country. And so I started seeing all these things in China and North Korea were very closely linked. And I just started seeing all these pieces. And then I started looking at the United States from a strategic perspective and seeing all these things that were going on. Uh, there was a, a Japanese admiral in World War II who was very famous uh, in, in Second Amendment circles, especially for his quote, where he said, uh, to invade America would be lunacy because there'd be a gun hidden by behind every blade of grass. Right. Yeah. But besides we had besides us having that deterrent here, there were all these politicians that were using any excuse they could come up with to try to ban and disarm the American public. I saw what I have always seen and even have been discussed in my former job is our greatest weakness, our our poorest southern border. And saw people talking about it but never even you know, no politicians wanted to actually make any movement towards securing it. Uh, we found out that since at least 2002, the cartels in Hezbollah and Al-Qaeda have been working together to smuggle 
the Al Qaeda and the Hezbollah fighters that were seasoned fighters from the wars in the Middle East would come over and train the cartel members in guerrilla warfare, wow. in fighting tactics, shooting, stuff like that. And in return, the cartels would smuggle them across the border. And you have Hezbollah and the cartels that actually have some uh, major uh, multinational drug things that they work on together and you know, uh, human trafficking, all kinds of stuff. But at the end of the day, they had this, I wash your back, you wash mine. We train your guys, you smuggle our guys across the quarter. And so we know there have been sleeper cells all over the United States for at least a decade, probably two, maybe more. And there's all these things that have been discovered, and yet nothing ever really happened. And so I started putting all these pieces together and saying, well, why? Why, why, would, this, why would all this be happening? And I talked to some of my old buddies and said, I, you know, I really want to start I, I want to take this writing about, this. and that is how the pact was born. It was these things that I actually saw going on in the world, and that's fiction for me has a lot of my life in it, uh, just because it's it's I, I've always been a very imaginative and creative person, and so it's kind of my way to taking this to the kind of next, I guess, the logical outcome. Well, I'm and it's theory that we're seeing a lot of it that we actually had politicians in the united states that were working with our enemies that it's it's really it's disgusting and terrifying to find out how accurate the book the books were yeah it's one actually when you mentioned hezbollah immediately uh, project cassandra popped up in my head something i talk oh, about yeah. all the time with obama oh, yeah. um just uh, the, the willingness to work with these people that are obviously enemies of ours is is a little terrifying um, but I'm very interested in checking out the book, and I'm very happy to hear that people like yourselves have a contingency plan in the event that something like this actually happens. Uh, I, you know, I'm I'm a, I'm a regular old civilian. I uh, I like to think that the Second Amendment and our armed forces would be able to protect us from something like that. But hey, always good to be prepared. And uh, and like I said, I'm glad to hear that people like yourself are. Uh, in, in the cut in the event that something like that does happen. But you served, like you mentioned, in Iraq, you served in Afghanistan, you served in North Africa. Um, and I kind of want to get your thoughts on our military involvement as a whole, really. Um, but more specifically, there was a recent peace deal that was signed with the Taliban, and we've actually had to strike them at least once since that deal was signed. You know, they're saying they'll behave, but it stands to reason that these are people that can't necessarily be trusted. You've been there. You've dealt with them, I'd, I'd assume, in some capacity or another. How do you feel about that peace plan in general before we get into some more general military action? I think I think it's interesting uh, to look at it. You've got to look at the greater macro picture. Uh, I think a lot of Americans still believe that we were fighting the Taliban. Uh, in reality, the Taliban is a group that has been in Afghanistan for a le very long time. It was when Al-Qaeda came in, and they actually partnered with the Taliban. The Taliban gave them safe harbor. Osama bin Laden had a lot of money. He basically helped fund a lot of things for the Taliban. But kind of the militant arm in the beginning was Al-Qaeda that was, that was located there. And the pa Taliban were a little more peaceful. They wouldn't give up Osama, um, depending on who you talk to. There's a great book. Uh, called Ghost Wars. Um, if you really want to dig into what Afghanistan really was, and what it really was was a proxy war, just like Iraq, where we weren't fighting Iraqis in Iraq. We were fighting a proxy war. It was basically, America is here. We have an open battlefield. So anybody in the world that wants to take down the U.S., come here and fight. And so that's what we found in, in Iraq. We were fighting Chechens, you know, in Afghanistan, we were fighting people from North Africa, Pakistanis, people from all over the place. Our ODA used to, just on every single meet, anytime we talked to a village elder, just somebody randomly on the street, we'd have these capabilities where we'd go out and just, you know, I was a medic. And so our medics would bring doctors. We would treat everybody that we could find for, you know, a couple of weeks on end. We did this all over Africa as well. Okay. And every time we'd meet with somebody, we'd ask them, where is Osama bin Laden? And every one of them would say, Pakistan. Like, not wow. joking, just like purely like, don't you know he's in Pakistan? And wow. that's one of the things that we really started to find out is that while we were giving billions of dollars in aid to Pakistan, Pakistan was actually our greatest enemy in that battle. Pakistan was harboring all of the worst terrorists in Waziristan. The Pakistani government was, it turns out, they were the ones that created and funded the Taliban and Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. They, you know, uh, India and Iraq, or India and uh, Pakistan are mortal enemies. Mm -hmm. They'll do anything to fight each other. So Pakistan, the ISI, 
which is the Pakistani intelligence service, uh, basically created the Taliban as a um, deterrent against India. And so it's kind of one of their militant forces where if anything ever happened with India and they control them. So a lot of this stuff that we saw wasn't in effect. It wasn't actually against the Taliban. It was against Pakistan. Yeah. And they played this game for a very long time. And we gave them a lot of money and either nobody knew, which I highly doubt, or President Trump was the first one to figure it out and cut off the aid to Pakistan and just started taking it to him. So when you look at kind of the greater, greater macro picture and you look what President Trump is doing, where he's not taking any of these things in isolation, he cut off the aid to Pakistan, he basically told them, we know what you've been doing, we're not going to fund you anymore if you're going to allow people to burn American flags in the streets and you know, throw our money in, their face, in our face and use it to arm terrorists that are killing our soldiers. And at the same time, going to the Taliban and saying, hey, we understand this didn't come with you, this didn't, this didn't start with you. We'll stop killing your kids. You stop killing our kids. And so I think the fact that he's looking at it from the multiple angles that it truly entails, uh, there might be something to it. Because, I mean, we've been fighting over there for 18, 19 years. Uh, I remember seeing the article that said the Afghan war is now old enough to vote, yeah. you know, which is insane. Um, but, uh, you know, who knows? I mean, the Taliban's the Taliban, and now they have people that are fighting that have grown up fighting, and they've been fighting their whole life. And Afghanistan has been at war longer than anybody, any other country on the planet. Um, I mean, they've been at war since Alexander the Great went in there. Yeah. You know, I mean, they've been at war forever, and they're good at it. Uh, unfortunately, the best fighters over there are fighting for the Taliban and not the Afghan National Army, uh, and that's always been an issue for us. Yeah. But if, if it works, uh, great. And I mean, that's the biggest thing. If we can marginalize Pakistan, I think that's the greatest, that, that was our greatest enemy there, not actually the Taliban. And Al-Qaeda's gone. Okay. Well, hey, that's, that's new but information to me. It, it might hold. And I, if you're interested in that, I highly suggest uh, Ghost Wars. And there's another book after that. And the entire, it's a two-book series. It's, it's about the... Uh, statecraft, of nation state geopolitics, and tradecraft, which is the espionage kind of spy portion of it. Okay. Um, more than, you know, just hand to hand combat. It's more about the greater picture and specifically what politicians were selling us out and, um, and how the spy game worked in the international funding. But it really it will help you gain a much better understanding awesome. of that whole conflict. I'm going to have to check that out. And it's, a, you know, not not funny, I was going to say, but uh, it, it's certainly apropos that you mentioned that there are kind of several fronts that these wars are being fought on. We, typical civilian over here, thinking to themselves, oh, it's a war, it's troops, they're shooting each other, there's bombs, whatever it is, but there's, there's a lot more going on on a whole lot of other different levels politically and then, like you mentioned, on, on the intelligence side of things as well. But uh, we kind of moved into these regime change wars. I mean, you mentioned the macro picture here. Trump takes office... And he asked the one question that to me seemed just unfathomable that it hadn't been asked to this point is how do we win? Which it, it <clears throat> seems seems perfectly logical until you take a step back and realize that there's no real conventional path to victory in these sorts of wars, at least not one that I could see. So what exactly is going on over there? And what are the troops on the ground saying about being over there and kind of filling in for all of these, again, sort of never ending regime change type wars? Yeah, and then you realize just how much of a game it really is to certain people, uh, and you realize that there, you know, sometimes there just really is no path to winning. We had guys in Afghanistan. I uh, so the way that special forces would work in Afghanistan is you have an area that is controlled, right? So we have a base in a certain area, and there's no longer daily attacks there. So at some point, you have to push further out into Indian territory, right? you got to push further out into enemy-controlled territory, and you've got to find a way to hold this new territory. So we had a team that went out to this place called the uh, Tagab Valley, which for the years that we were there was one of the hottest places in Afghanistan. And this ODA went from Bagram out to the Tagab Valley in the middle of the night, had engineers build a base around them, right? So these big HESCO barriers, which are basically enormous sandbags, built them around them as they had a security perimeter. And then during our uh, eight month deployment, it was their job to start securing this whole part of the territory. 
And so we, a lot of what Green Berets do are, is not just combat, but also intelligence, right? So right. we drive our own missions. Instead of somebody from higher up calling us and saying, here's your mission, it's our job to go out and run our own intelligence and figure out who the bad guys are, who we need to go get, who we need to pay off, what we have to do. So our team out there in the Tagab had this guy that made a lot of money uh, in the war because he was just a very thrifty businessman. And he was being paid to build gas stations. So, you know, they people, you can't really compare the USA and Afghanistan. I mean, they had, when we were there, they had one highway that they were trying to build that just does not have the infrastructure. So if somebody got the bright idea of, hey, you know, if you put gas stations in, they can have more cars, they can get around more, maybe they'll have more commerce, maybe they'll make more money, maybe they'll not shoot as much. So they were paying a lot of people to build these things. They would pay locals. And we had a talk with this guy one night, and uh, we were asking him, like, how, how much do you get paid per gas station? And it was something, I can't remember if it was one or 10 million, but it was, it was a substantial amount of money to build a gas station. Wow. Yeah. And then our, our Intel guy that was talking to him went, how much does it cost you to build a gas station? Well, oh, hundred grand, hundred thousand. Wow. You get all the stuff and get it. And so you got to think about all the people from that guy to other people that were building the highways or building buildings like Joe Biden's brother who got that <laughs> $1.5 billion contract to build houses who had never built houses before, built houses in Iraq. Yep. Um, there's a lot of people with their fingers in the pie. Uh, that do not want it to end, you know, and that's the whole, that's DC's fight against Donald Trump right now is that Washington DC has three of the highest per capita income zip codes in the United States. And all of that is from taxpayer dollars. It's yeah. not innovators. It's not tech titans. It's not shrewd businessmen. It's lobbyists and people that are getting government contracts and people that are suckling off the teeter of the American taxpayer. And that's why they're so angry and they're doing everything they can to get rid of him because they know he wants to put it to an end. And you saw a lot of that same stuff in Afghanistan and Iraq, where it's not as much people that want to win the war as it is people that want to continue getting rich off of the war. Yeah, we've been we've been seeing that for a long time, unfortunately, here in the States. Um, I mean, yeah, it, it is one of those situations where it's just it's not in the interest of the people who are making the decisions to get out of here. But then we got Trump who comes in, right? And, and it's been a lot of rhetoric. There hasn't been a ton of movement. I mean, obviously, he tried to pull troops out of Syria. Um, he's he's in the process of hopefully trying to get them out of Afghanistan. But for, for, again, somebody who's not involved in the military, somebody who doesn't maybe understand the intricacies of all this sort of stuff, I, mean, I look at this situation and go, let's get them all out of there. Let's get everybody out of the Middle East. Let's get everybody out of Africa. Um, now, I understand that there's there could be some complications, and maybe you can explain to me what some of those would be. But... What, what is the end game here if there is one aside from the, the, the agenda of the corrupt D.C. population? Right. Well, I mean, so for one, they know that if we pull out and it's considered a loss, it's a huge hit for morale. And there's a lot of people. I lost over a dozen buddies between Iraq and Afghanistan and Africa. And there's a lot of us that would feel like, OK, did they die for nothing? Right. I think a lot of us that really understood what we were doing and, and truly believe in what we were doing wouldn't have that feeling. But there's a lot of people that might. Uh, to really understand like what the thinking was before him, uh, before President Trump, I wrote a pretty long thread on Twitter maybe six months ago that kind of outlined the rules of engagement, right? Like why do U.S. soldiers love President Trump so much and why do they hate Obama so much? Uh, and a really good way to look at that is to understand the rules of engagement. Um, so I had a friend, I have a friend that's a multi, multi New York Times bestselling author. And the New York Times went to him and said, we want you to write an article because we can't figure out how did Trump destroy ISIS in just a couple of years when Obama couldn't do it during his entire tenure. Right. That seems so my like a, quite the mystery. Written, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a simple question, right? So my buddy has, you know, he writes books for people in the CIA, the FBI, JSOC, all over the place. So he went to some of his different contacts and all these different places, and they all came back with the same answer. And it's because... President Trump removed the rules of engagement. And the New York Times, even though they paid him and commissioned him to write this article, they wouldn't print it because, in their words, it made Trump look good. Of course. So, yeah. of course. But to understand what the rules of engagement are, it's basically when you're a soldier, you have your rules of engagement that tell you what you can do, what you can do in a war zone, right? So, um, 
there are a couple of places that are, have been considered free fire zones. You know, there hadn't been one since Vietnam until we got in Afghanistan. A free fire zone just being, hey, basically protect your own life. Right. Uh, and yeah. it, was, it was that way for a while until Obama came in. And Obama put extremely restrictive ROEs on people. And not just the restrictive ROEs, but also prosecuted soldiers any time that they felt they got out of line. Uh, so I've got a great kind of story that helps explain just how dangerous that is. When a large part of my deployment to Afghanistan, the first one was at this place called Fab Shank, um, that's out in Logar province, which is really close to the Pakistan border. And we would get mortared and shelled all the time. Before my ODA got there, there were no combat units there. It was a big logistical base. There were some engineers and some EOD, but no ground pounders, no people that actually went to go engage with and kill the enemy. So we got there. They would get mortared. We would grab our stuff, drive out the gate, go find the people shooting the missiles, and we'd take them out. Surprisingly enough, they stopped getting mortared. It's amazing how that works. Or not mortared, but rockets shot at them. So a good friend of mine actually came there just a few months after I left, right? So I left Afghanistan and went straight to Iraq. And a buddy of mine that's in civil affairs had switched with me. He went to Fab Shank. He was there when Obama came on. So under Bush, they kept up the same thing. Another combat unit replaced us. So if somebody did rocket them, they'd go out, they'd kill the bad guys, and they wouldn't get rocketed anymore. But Obama changed the ROE. So these guys could no longer do that. Right, you couldn't actually shoot at anybody and positively ID them. You had all of these crazy things where you couldn't even shoot back. It, he put the rules so strict on soldiers that you had a lot of guys who would second guess themselves, defending themselves because they thought they would get prosecuted if they made the wrong move. Okay, which is a, a really bad move because that means there's a high likelihood that you're going to get shot before you react because you're stopping and you're thinking and you're. You're scared that you're going to get hurt. It, it, it sounds a and lot was, like the, what the police are dealing with here in the United, you know, in in the mainland with the, you know, with a variety of the, you know, obviously any any time somebody of color gets shot by a police officer, it's front page news on every newspaper and all that sort of stuff. It's got to start drilling in some doubt to a certain degree, and that, that I can only imagine that's exponentially more dangerous on the battlefield. Well, and that's exactly what it is, and that's where we have the Soros funded prosecutors and DAs that are coming in and actually prosecuting cops for doing the right thing or the media that is making it, they're turning into a psyop. It's a psychological operation against anybody that would actually defend America. They're trying to make people not want to be cops and not want to be soldiers. And you see the same thing in Hollywood. I'm out here in Los Angeles. I have friends that are screenwriters and authors and Hollywood. It really is sickening when you hear some of the stories that they turn down because it makes police or soldiers look good, right? They just, they don't want any of them. They only want a movie about a soldier if they can twist it to make it seem like he's evil or bent on killing or has a psychological break, same thing with a cop. They'll have dirty cops, they'll have corrupt cops, but they won't have good, honest police actually trying to do the right thing because it's, it's a multifaceted psychological operation against people that want to defend this country or, or defend the weak. And it, it really is scary when you, you understand all the stuff going on behind the scenes and, and what they're really trying to do. Um, but yeah, it is. It, it's, it is what it is. And that's one of the things that Trump did when he came in. Uh, another thing Obama required was intelligence and military commanders would have to submit anything they wanted to do back to Washington, D.C., to a bunch of people in the Obama administration with zero military experience who would then have to you know, discuss the options and then get it back. So things move very quickly on the battlefield. So by the time a commander sent something to Washington, it came back three, four, five days later, it was too late to actually act on that. That's one of the big things that General Flynn was doing, was he was cutting D.C. out of the loop. He wanted to extricate the military from the other intelligence agencies and the bureaucracy to make it much faster. That's actually one of the biggest things General Flynn did before he was National Security Advisor. He's highly, highly accredited for going in and taking an intelligence command at JSOC and greatly increasing the speed of collecting intelligence and putting it to use on the battlefield because he cut out this entire bureaucracy that Obama required. And it really is amazing that that's, that's, it's a very simple thing, but it's what President Trump did. He went in, he talked to the military, he said, okay, you guys know better than me. You guys know what's going on there better than any general back here. 
the ball is back in your court. You do what you have to do. You do it the way you have to do it. But I want to stop seeing Americans dead, and I want to see our enemies going away. And sure enough, as soon as he did that, ISIS started getting their asses handed to him. And you meant you mentioned General Flynn there. I got I got to ask. I mean, obviously, it sounds like uh, what you're talking about there probably contributed to the Obama administration's targeting of General Flynn. Right? It kind of made them look bad, and the whole thing, obviously. And he was he was uh, vehemently against the Iraq deal or the Iran deal, rather. Um, and, and the politicization of the intelligence community as a whole, uh, do you think, you know, is this specific thing something that you think helped contribute towards their targeting of him? Well, it's not just that. It's the same issue we had with people not wanting us to, air quotes, win in Iraq or Afghanistan. It was people, it was greedy people, right? So a lot of the intelligence community, you know, that's General Flynn has been in intelligence for 32 years. So he knows a lot about how it works, how it's supposed to work, and how it's bloated. There's a, a big thing in the military. There's fraud, waste, and abuse. They're always saying you see fraud, waste, and abuse reported, right, so they can they can get rid of it. And that's one thing that General Flynn saw is that there are an awful lot of people in our intelligence community that are nothing more than bureaucratic bloat. They don't actually contribute to the end result. They do nothing but waste time. They add time to the process, and that's intelligent. Time is a huge aspect, right? You find something that's going to happen. You have to be able to react before it goes in. And so you take an intelligence. You have to be able to vet the intelligence. You've got to be able to figure out what you're going to do about it, and then you've got to be able to get who's going to react, and you've got to react. So there's a lot of steps already. When you add in five, six, seven bureaucratic steps in there that add nothing to the final product, you end up missing a lot. You miss a lot of your targets because you can't react by the time you get intel. And each one of those people is getting paid. And usually at that level, they have an assistant that's getting paid and a secretary that's getting paid and all these other people. And there was an awful lot of money just being wasted by people that did not need to be in the process. And a lot of these people are the same people you saw fighting back against Sir Flynn. And that's, it was a lot of it was job security. Uh, some of it was because he really knew some of the things that were going on. When you look at the Obama administration and you start drilling into the Muslim Brotherhood connected people that were let in by his administration, just Huma Abedin alone, just because of her family's connections to the Muslim Brotherhood and her own connection to the Muslim Brotherhood, she should have never had a national security clearance. And there are a lot of people like that. There are emails uh, from the WikiLeaks, WikiLeaks dumps of people in the Obama administration turning people down because they weren't affiliated with certain groups. It, it really is disgusting. And he knew all that. General Flynn absolutely knew. If you haven't read Field of Fight, uh, you absolutely should. And I think that that's exactly it's another one of the reasons they were targeting him. Uh, because he he knew what was going on. He saw he saw just kind of like me with with uh, writing the book and just seeing the writing on the wall, except he had firsthand knowledge. He he saw these things happening and he was going to put an end to it and they couldn't let that happen. Wow. Yeah. I mean, uh, with the, President Trump's been doing a hell of a job of adding jobs to the market here, but if he wanted to cut several thousand in the D.C. area, I don't know that a lot of us would complain. Like I said, we'd get rid of a lot of this bureaucracy. We'd probably be better off. Uh, real quick, though, since we were talking about General Flynn, are you, are you optimistic about how this is all going to shake out for him? Obviously, his attorney's been just beating the government over the head with all of their miscues over the course of the investigation. Now you think we're going to see justice for General Flynn? I, I absolutely do. Uh, number one, I grew up in Texas. Don't mess with Texas women. They will punch you in the oh, face. Sidney Powell's a lion. bulldog, man. <laughs> Sidney Powell is a bulldog. And if you look at it, again, taking things that are going on currently in our world, if you take things in isolation, they don't make sense. But if you take a step back and you look at the greater macro picture, and you look at all these pieces that are all starting to line up perfectly, right? And it really, it's like a symphony that at the beginning, it sounded discombobulated. You had the wrong people in the wrong chairs. You had some notes that were off. People were on the wrong timing. But now, if you look at where we are right now, you look at just the last couple of weeks, right? You've got Richard Grinnell as the active, acting ODNI. You've got Ratcliffe stepping up to, to become the new DNI head. Yeah. You've got a lot of these people getting filtered out. You've got mysteriously all this stuff starts showing up. They had another thing that just came out this week where now they have more verified internal memos that the Mueller special counsel knew within two weeks yep. 
that there was no Russian collusion case, yet he went on for two years. Yeah, and that was, uh, John Solomon was reporting that, I believe. I just, I just heard about that today. Yeah, and you start looking at all these things that are starting to happen, and they're not happening in isolation. There is a greater undercurrent that nobody really knew that was going on. One thing that I and this so the 600 cartel members that were just arrested, uh, I believe that was yesterday, and that one didn't get reported much. But what did not get reported at all is they also took down the largest cybercrime network on the planet. They took down at least a dozen different pedophile networks. Wow. And you see the speed of which you think, and these are all things, by the way, that there's a lot of people out there that are on the fence about Jeff Sessions. Every one of these things that's coming to fruition from the DOJ right now are things that were set in place by Jeff Sessions. And that's one day, and I hope it comes soon, but he will be seen as one of the heroes of the second American revolution because he set these things in place with the prosecutors that he set up, the direction that he sent the DOJ in, all the things that he started working on that the wheels of justice turned slow, but they're all starting to ring home now. And I think General Flynn, he knows, you know, they've changed out the prosecution that were going against them. They're starting to question all of these things that, uh, that were done against them nefariously and all these things that didn't make any sense. Um, yeah. Oh, absolutely. And now that his son is starting to speak out as well and actually come and, and tell the truth about, hey, you know, they were threatening me. I had a four month old baby. They're going to throw me in solitary confinement for nothing. And oh, by the way, General Flynn was charged for FARA papers that he hired the top FARA legal agency in the country to file right. and fill out. And he got charged for them screwing it up. There's just there's all these things that don't make sense. And they're all starting to come to the light. And I I do not see any way that this doesn't get cleaned up, right? I mean, all the stuff about Mueller starting to come out, all the stuff about corrupt U.S. politicians is coming out, all the stuff that was done to General Flynn and everybody else is starting to come out. I, I think people will be happy with the end result, yeah, but it's taking too long. Yeah, it is. It's, 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 not, uh, it's, it's not on our time Exactly. A lot, a lot of people are getting frustrated. I'm, 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 in, I'm in the crew there. Um, now, Robert, I know you got a hard stop. Do you need to go anytime soon? Uh, no, actually, look, Los Angeles just canceled uh, uh, any big gathering, so oh. I think I'll be able to go there tonight anyway. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Well, then I got a couple other things to ask you about. While I was perusing thepactbook.com, which is where you can go to find out all about the Pact Book, um, I, I happened to run across the, the Gateway Project. Now, I'm a bit of a conspiracy guy from time to time, and I have a bunch of friends that do podcasts in that space that I would love to hook you up with potentially at some point in the future. But um, they, uh, I read this this page about the Gateway Project, and my mind was blown. I'm sure you're going to do a much better uh, job of explaining it to uh, to my listeners than I could. But if you could just give a synopsis of what this was, this completely blew my mind. Yeah, so when I was halfway finish writing the second book in the Pact series, the Pact Book 2, Battle Hymn of the Republic, um, I have a friend of mine that was a ranger with Ranger Battalion who shot me over a file, and it was a declassified CIA memo on the Gateway Project. And it was one of those things, it's a lengthy file, but it goes into some pretty heavy science stuff. And I, I was a medic in the Army. I, I had a business degree before I went into the Army. Uh, I loved to be a medic. I got out, I did pre-med. So I have a lot of physics behind me, and I've also... I don't know, my entire life, nothing, the official narrative never added up for me. So I, too, I mean, I was that kid in middle school checking out books on the library. Yeah. I just, it, it didn't, it never added up to me. So I am, I am one that takes a lot of that stuff. I, I'll read them all. Some of them, you know, you immediately go, this is how can you write it off. But the stuff, some of this stuff really, really makes sense. So he sent me this declassified CIA memo about the Gateway Project. And this was kind of uh, made made into parody with that movie, The Men That Stare at Goats. I don't know if have you ever seen yeah, that. I have. Yeah. Right. So there's actually truth to that. And there's another documentary called Third Eye Spies uh, that I watched in preparation for uh, the third book in the pack that I'm finishing up now. There's this guy, Russell Targ, and uh, he started doing this research on uh, paranormal stuff, basically remote viewing, uh, back in the 70s. And he actually got, I can't remember exactly how it happened, but 
he and another researcher that was a former CIA guy ended up getting a contract to go work at the Stanford Research Institute. So at Stanford, right? Pretty well acclaimed. Yeah. And they were paid to start up or they got funded by one aspect of the government. I think it might have been the army to start a remote viewing project. And they hooked up with this guy named Ingo Swan, who was he just he had a gift for it. Right. And one day they so if you don't understand what remote viewing is, remote viewing is essentially I can sit right here. And if I can be a remote viewer, somebody can give me a, a coordinate, nothing more than numbers. And for a really good guy, they can they can physically see from their seat in Los Angeles. They can see wherever this coordinate is and describe it with alarming accuracy. And the guys that are really good are phenomenal. So they're at the SRI. Somebody, one of the CIA guys, walks down the hallway to somebody else and says, "Hey, give me a give me a grid coordinate, any grid coordinate." And you know, the guy says, well, does it matter what's there? He says, uh, it's better if there's not a lot, but something that you know can be written in great detail, so pretty scenery. Hmm. So the guy goes, okay, well, here's a, here's a grid coordinate to where I just built my log cabin. There's nothing out there for miles around. So the guy takes a grid coordinate, goes back into the other room, gives the remote viewer the grid coordinates. And this guy starts drawing this enormous base, all this security and he starts describing, okay, now in the third level down under the ground, there's a file cabinet, and it's green. And inside the oh, file cabinet, wow. there's these folders that have these code names. And I can't remember. They all had the same, like, military terminology, where it was, like, paperclip, paper shuffle, you know, it all, all had the same kind of code names. Jeez. And so he brings it back, and the guy goes, ah, I don't really know what this is. This seems kind of goofy. This is just supposed to be out in the middle of nowhere. So they had another office that was doing the same coordinates, and it turns out the remote viewer there had the same exact thing, same exact file names and whatever. So they call one of their bosses at the DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency or DOD or somewhere, and they start describing it, and all kinds of alarms start going off. All of a sudden, they have security people from every single agency that has clandestine operations coming down to them, trying to wanting to throw them in jail. And it turns out it was one of the most secret NSA black sites in the United States of America. It was wow. just five miles from the cabin. And these file names that this guy had described in a folder locked three levels underground were all special access programs that nobody knew about in the pre-internet. Um, and they were really freaking out to, to figure out how these things found. So after that happens, a lot of people in the government start saying, oh, my God, there's something to this. So the DIA, the CIA, the NSA, every intelligence agency you can imagine starts coming in and throwing funding at these guys and, and having a look at what they do. So this declassified CIA memo was uh, a colonel who was tasked to figure out, like, what what is this? What is this real? What's this all about? And so it's this long, comprehensive memo that's on the CIA's website. You can go find it in their deep classified sales. There's a, there's a link to it on the Packbook. I was going to say, yeah, it's there. Uh, that's where I found it. I was, I was skimming through it myself. So guys, check it out, the Packbook.com. But I'm sorry, go ahead. And this guy, this colonel, goes through, and it's pretty high detail about the physics and all this stuff about all these different aspects. And there was a group called the Monroe Institute that had actually been working on this stuff long before the DIA, before Stanford Research Institute, before the CIA, before any of them. He had been researching the same thing. Uh, this guy, Bob Monroe, was the guy that had a near-death experience. And um, his near-death experience had a lot to do with sound, right? He had this kind of epiphany about sound. So when he got out, he started research, when he came back to life, he started researching how sound waves impact the human brain. Wow. And he found that he could have certain tones emitted that could make the brain do or see or think different things. And so he developed this thing called the Gateway Project that the DIA and the CIA ended up putting a lot of funding into, where they could essentially use uh, what are called binaural beats or tones, specifically specific tones they would put your brainwave into a specific pattern that would allow a message to bypass the filter part of the brain and go directly into the rest of the brain. So, you know, that idea, a lot of people say, oh, we don't even use 90% of our brain. Right. Well, he could use these tones to essentially allow people to use all of their brain, all their brain matter, 
do things that humans aren't supposed to be able to do, see things they're not supposed to be able to see. And he could put a regular Joe off the street using tones into the same level of meditative state as a Zen monk who's been doing it for 10 years just by using these tones. And that's what gateway is. It's essentially using these tone patterns to get your brain waves into the right place and helping people do kind of superhuman things. Um, that was a really long explanation, but no. it's, a, it's an amazing memo. I mean, if you have any understanding of science whatsoever, read the memo and it will blow your mind and yeah. just realize this, this stuff is real. The government put hundreds of millions of dollars into researching this stuff. Uh, that documentary, Third Eye Spies, it's phenomenal. It's on Amazon Prime right now. Uh, and it goes through just the re remote viewing aspect of it. Um, but it really is phenomenal, the things that humans can do that nobody really wants us to know about. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if you watch Stranger Things, but for some of my listeners out there, oh, yeah. yeah, that's that's Eleven. That's what she's doing, right, is remote viewing, essentially. Well, she, yeah, she does remote viewing, but astral projection is like where she puts herself in another physical place, uh, telekinesis. I don't know if anybody's actually mastered that yet, but uh, there, there's a lot of stuff that, again, most average uh, average people will hear it say, oh, that's nonsense, that's hokey. But there's a guy that was in the remote viewing program for the uh, Army, and he got the Legion of Merit and, like, 50 different citations for, and you can actually, third eye spies, they go through the citation that he got. This guy was identifying Russian nuclear sub building hangars that nobody had been able to find. He was being able to find all kinds of stuff of, of high intelligence value. Um, so that's our military has used this stuff for a very long time. They just nobody believes it, but it's it's out there. It's out it's there. Nuts. It's yeah. real. <laughs> I was I was getting a little lost in the thick of the science when I was reading through the memo, but just the fact that it's a CIA memo about this project, I mean, that should be eye opening enough to some people. Um, I, I want to just, I got a couple more things for you. The last one, like you said, is probably going to take a little time and I don't want to take too much of your time here. Um, but my second to last thing I do have to ask, uh, you're a 32nd degree Freemason. Uh, can you tell me all the secrets of the world? I'm kidding. Yeah, um, unfortunately. <laughs> it's more research than anything else. <laughs> That, that, that would make a lot of sense. I'm sure it would take a long time for you to explain them all to me anyway. But uh, I mean, in all seriousness, I mean, I guess um, the, the Freemasonry has a, there's a stigma about it, particularly people in the conspiracy realm. Uh, what what exactly? I guess. How did you get involved in that? And, and for, for those of us who are on the outside looking in without giving away too many secrets, what exactly does that mean for you? Yeah. And, you know, I expected to hear a lot more about that uh, because that so. Again, I've been reading conspiracy theory stuff my entire life. That's what led me to Freemasonry, right? There are there are some people that will read or hear things and, and hear that, oh, well, these people are doing this or these people are doing this. I'm the kind of guy that I have to see it for myself, right? There's just a part of me that my entire life, I just, I don't take other people's word for it. I'm a cynic by nature, and so I have to go see it for myself. And everything that I read, I've always been curious. I've always felt things didn't add up. And every single conspiracy theory I read led or ended at Freemasonry, right? It's just, it's that's where true. they all led. And all of them at the end of the day said Freemasons control and all that. And I went, well, okay, how do I become Freemason? How do I do this? And uh, at the time I was going through pre-med, I was working at a hospital that had a lodge just a couple blocks away from me, figured out how to be a member, went over there, did that. I got to the third degree, which you become a master mason, and I didn't feel like many of my questions had been answered. So, I, you know, there's two, after you get to be a master mason, there's Scottish Rite, there's York Rite. I went to a Scottish Rite, because there was a Scottish Rite Lodge very near me, so I made my way up to the 32nd degree. Uh, still didn't feel like I had enough answers, so I actually became the secretary for the Los Angeles Valley of Scottish Rite, which means for a while I controlled the checkbooks I was literally in the office of one of the largest Scottish Rite groups in the United States wow. uh, and still didn't find the answer. But what I did find at the end of the day, so Freemasonry is it's an enormous organization. And there are two groups of people. Babe, this is a very big generalization, oh, but sure. there's mainly two groups of people that are in Freemasonry. People like me that are looking for answers, right? That just, so, it's funny, a lot of people in our age group saw a national treasure or something like that. Yeah. And they went, okay, I want to, what is that? I want to figure out what that is. I want, I want to, I want to know what all this is about. 
And then there's another huge group of specifically the older people that, you know, you got to remember in like the, the 40s and 50s, it was one of those things where you just, everybody was a Mason. You know, a huge part of the population were Masons. And so a lot of people went there just for the you know, solidarity, for kind of a group to be a part of. Our, a lot of our forefathers were more group oriented than our generation are. And so you have a lot of the older folk that, were, that are there, and especially now that they're older and retired, that are there for a lot of camaraderie. And then you have a lot of younger generation that's really just there looking for answers. Okay. I did not find anybody with nefarious intentions, but there are a lot of uh, what are called appendant bodies. So there are a lot of different groups that aren't Freemasonry, but that were started by Freemasons. And so there's a lot of conspiracy theories that you'll hear about Freemasonry where they talk about Elster Crowley, the father of, um, right. uh, I can't remember what he was, but uh, he was a Freemason. And there are a lot of people that were, and that's, I mean, there's a huge millions and millions of members that are Freemasons. And you have a group that's that big, you're going to have people go do some nefarious things. It, that's uh, that's but, sort of how I was thinking about it, too, is that anytime you get a big enough group, you're going to have some nefarious folks in the mix. You're going to have some honest yeah. folks. You're going to have some people somewhere in the middle. Um, that's uh, that's enlightening, though. Thank you for, uh, for for giving, I guess, a little bit of information you, you could there. Um, last thing, this is a big one, and I, I don't I don't mean to cut short the Freemasonry, but I know you have a lot to talk about on this one, QAnon. Um, it's like, yeah. like I mentioned, I'm a conspiracy theorist at heart. I struggle with this one, I think, more than any other conspiracy theory I've ever come across, mostly because I just so badly want it to be true. It's like, would it be nice for there to be aliens? Yeah, sure, but it really doesn't affect me until they come down and start <laughs> killing everybody. It's not like it doesn't yeah. affect my day-to-day -day as much, but I'm, I'm a huge Trump supporter. I'm very much in the know on this QAnon thing. I've, I've kind of done a lot of research on it. I want to bite so bad. Is, is there something you can give me to, to, to push me over the edge? Uh, well, I, I'll tell you how I got involved in it. Um, I was chief marketing officer for this veteran-based media company called Heroes Media Group. And uh, the CEO of Heroes went to this, um, he went to a meeting in D.C. two, two and a half years ago. And it was one of those meetings, uh, it was on um, online child trafficking and pedophile networks. And how essentially a lot of the big tech companies were helping them get away with it, right? So whether they were looking the other way or actually providing private forums for them. And it was one of those groups, it was one of those conferences where everybody had an earpiece and everybody worked for some intelligence agency or government, you know, part of the DOJ or something like that. Okay. And he got approached at the end of this meeting uh, by somebody that was with the government uh, who said that they were trying to find media companies to talk about some of the good things that the government was doing, right? Like specifically hunting down child trafficking networks, things like that, because as this guy put it, nobody in the MSM would cover the good things the U.S. government was doing under President Trump. Right. And so uh, Adam came back and he kind of cast me with that. Like, I want you to find out the good things. What, like, what is the U.S. government? What's the cyber command doing now? What are all these things going on? And so we started researching, and kind of like when I was younger, every conspiracy theory led to Freemasonry. Uh, a lot of this stuff that I found was talking about this thing, Q, QAnon. And I had seen it mentioned here and there on my social media, but I didn't really get it. I didn't know what it was. So doing my research, I decided I, I had to figure it out, right? So I went, I went to, I think it was QAnon.pub at that time, which is since gone down and come back up and gone down. Right, yeah, I think uh, it's, it's qmap.pub nowadays, but yeah. Yeah, so QMAP, qmap.pub is the one that I use now. Uh, but I went through and I read every drop, and this was 2017, so there weren't, I think there was maybe a 1,000 something. It wasn't up to the 3,000 it is now. Yeah. And I went through every single drop from start to finish. And being a guy that's been, you know, very, very tied into geopolitics my entire life and conspiracy theories my entire life, I saw so many threads and so many things that I have looked into previously that, you know, either they added another layer to the thread or they provided an answer in a different way. But I, I realized that there was something to it. So I actually started digging very, very heavily into it connecting with a lot of other people that were researching it. And I wrote my first article about Q. Uh, what if Q, QAnon, and the Great Awakening are real? 
I think back in 2017. Yep. And then last year I wrote another one and halfway through last year, uh, called, uh, president Trump, JSOC and QAnon, the plan to save the world. Um, and it's, helping to it's it's finding a way to help put all these into easily understandable easily understandable things right so the first one what if q q and on the great awakening are real is a really kind of high level picture of essentially what it is right and when you look at it like anything else you have some people that are just trying to tear it down and that can be for any number of reasons that can be somebody that is doing something bad and doesn't want to get caught it can be, you know, possibly it's the MSM just trying to stop anything that makes President Trump look good. Um, the biggest thing that has gotten me so far, right? So, like, I'm a, I'm a numbers guy. Okay. And statistics, you can use statistics to, to show some pretty unusual correlations, right? So there is there's a thing called a regression analysis where you can take a couple of different variables and you can statistically determine – if something is chance or, you know, what the probability is that something is, is, is done by chance or if there's no statistical way it's by chance. Yeah. If it's just a pattern, it's a real pattern that's occurring. Right. Okay. Right. And so that's the thing you can, you can actually correlate the president Trump's tweets to QAnon drops and statistically you do a regression analysis. They're statistically linked, right? There have been so many connections that have what's called a zero Delta. They're at the same time about the same message a lot of times including the same wording, right? So yeah. a big thing that a, a lot of Q de detractors will say is that it's just somebody in their mother's basement uh, that is aggregating news and regurgitating it in a cryptic way, right? The yeah, problem a is, that's a theory, and it, it is one that I hear a lot. The problem is Q is ahead of the news cycle so many times. Yeah. So there are things that Q will put out that isn't anywhere else in the news cycle, right? So military funding being used to build the wall. He was talking about that months before anybody in the media even thought that was a possibility. So if that was somebody that was just aggregating media, it's impossible for them to be ahead of the media. Uh, another big one was John Durham, right? So we knew John Durham, the U.S. attorney from Utah, had been appointed months before any of the media even knew that that had happened. Yeah, they didn't even know we who he knew, was for the most part. Yeah, nobody has name had. I mean, it, in things in Utah, but it had never been a national name before that. He was months ahead of that, and there are proof after proof after proof of these things that he has been way out ahead of the news cycle, or things that you know maybe a year or two later turn out to be dead on accurate. And there's a there's a. a I'm not sure, but there's this guy, Praying Medic, who was kind of the first Q researcher that I started watching and following to help really understand what it was and put it in a very logical, easy to understand context. And he says that people call Q a, a cult or a LARP, um, but if that's true, he would be the first cult leader that nobody's ever met, that has never asked anybody for money, and his entire message is trying to convince people to think for themselves. Right. So he kind of yeah. goes against what any cult leader would ever be. Right. Because nobody knows who he is and there is no money. And that's another thing. If you look at the amount of drops that are out there, just the amount, even if it was somebody just aggregating news, the volume of stuff that's out there and the accuracy, which is just mind blowing. If you really look at it with an open mind, you would have to ask yourself, who would do this with no incoming revenue stream? Right. Like what individual person could afford to spend this much time doing this? Because the level of detail is phenomenal. So who could spend this much time making these things connect? I mean, there are drops that connect one year apart, two years apart, six months apart. To spend that much time, number one, if somebody just did this in the basement and they had the brain that could contemplate that, they belong in Mensa and they belong at NASA right. because they were brilliant. But the amount of resources that that would take. Oh, they're coming for no you. Oh, yeah, oh, LA. It's <laughs> raining in LA. People lose all their mind to try to drive in LA when it's raining. But just to think about the fact that there is no revenue stream coming in to pay for all these resources and all this time, right? And that's when you're looking at like cyber operations, a lot of the times when they can, when they start trying to figure out if it's a private entity or if it's a state-funded entity like China or Russia, you look at the amount of resources that are put into something. 
because in the cyber world, there's a certain amount of resources that can only be state funded, right? Number one, from the type of technology being used, and number two, from the amount of resources, because only a nation state can afford to dedicate hundreds of people to an operation with no incoming revenue stream, right? right? No company can do that. No individual can do that. You can't really afford to put that much in. And just if you read all of them with an open mind and just pay attention to some of the researchers, it, it is phenomenal. The amount of time and effort. And one of the things that, that Q likes to say is that, you know, there's three years of planning that went into this before the first deep drop even happened. And if you look at it with an open mind, it really, I mean, it's just phenomenal. The way that things link up and another huge proof point that we've been on to for about a year is there are Q drops that link up with the official U.S. government, a lot of them in the DOD, so U.S. Marines, uh, U.S. Army, Cyber Command, um, uh, Special Operations, things like this, that line up perfectly with Q-drops. Yeah. And it can be a week, and I don't think it can be a year later. But just to understand that, like, to have a drop ahead of not just the media, but official U.S. government resources, and to claim that that person isn't somehow affiliated with the government. And then you look at all the different pictures that Q has posted that are from Air Force One, that are with President Trump, that you can use TinEye to find if an image has been printed anywhere else on the Internet. And he's dropping these original pictures with the president that exist nowhere else on the Internet. Yeah. You, that, that doesn't come from somebody aggregating data in mom's basement. It's, no, it's not to at the all. point where I, you, I, I, understand, I understand the media's reasoning, right? Because if Q is proven to be true, the media is pointless. We right? are because the media people, now, right? That's what he always says anyway. <laughs> that's the big thing because we're so far ahead of the news cycle. And if... This has been nothing else than a sign-up to, than to train people to understand, to question the narrative, and to research for themselves. Then it's a wild success. All you have to do is go on Twitter for a couple hours and realize just how much people have woken up to what is BS. And when it Q first started, the media would come out with a narrative, and it might take a couple of days or a week or a month for people to realize it was horse manure. Right, that the right. media was trying to spin a narrative that was absolutely spun out of whole cloth. But now you see media narratives that are disproven within minutes because so many people are so on the ball and there are so many researchers that have been weaponized by Q that they see something from the media and they go, ah, it doesn't sound right. And they just go start researching. And there are these huge groups of researchers. We call it the hive mind now. Yep. There are all these people that we've all connected on Twitter in all these different places that we see something come out, we go, that's not true. And you'll have a hundred people working together. And this is what 8chan is now, or 8 Coon is now, is that a bunch of people researching the same topic together and everybody brings their own kind of specialty to it. Everybody brings their own outlook to it. And they'll all go all research these different aspects of it and find to the most granular details why this is true or why that isn't, this isn't true. And it, it really is phenomenal. Uh, and it, I was gonna say I'm, I'm always astonished whenever I get on the QMap dot pub, and I, I follow along. I don't know, I don't know that I'm a, a officially a full time believer yet, although you are pushing me slightly closer to it. Um, but I'm looking at you go on to any of those drops, you click on any of the Twitter links, right? Because a lot of the times these Q drops are, are tweets or something along those lines. You click on that Twitter link and you look at the comments. It's hundreds, if not thousands of people. Q sent me. I'm here for Q. Where we go one, we go all. Yada, yada, yada. I mean, some of these people are probably bots. Sure. But they can't all be at a certain point. Like, I mean, it just, it's its overwhelming. I think a lot of people think this is some distant thing that only a certain section of the population think about. But there are probably people in your life, whether you know it or not, that are believers in this. And it's, it, there's been a few of the drops that just completely blew my mind the uh the four contractors that had access to the nsa database i think q dropped that like a year before i yeah. ever heard it even in the alternate media um that was kind yeah. of fascinating there was even a video that the that the u.s army or the defense department put together department of defense rather and uh they have sure enough right there in the middle of the video there's a mug that has just the letter q on it like at that point i threw up my hands yeah. and i'm like okay that it seems so insignificant but it's 
enough of these things start adding up, like you said, it, it becomes almost to the point to where it can't be a coincidence anymore. Uh, a couple couple last couple things on this, though. Uh, you mentioned 8 Kuhn, which I guess is the new platform that, uh, that, that has taken over for 8chan. Do you think 8chan was shut down to silence Q? Uh, I can't. So the thing about 8chan, 4chan. So in the in the last article that I put out about Q, which is the President Trump uh, chase on Q and on the planet save the world, um, I went through the very beginnings, right? Specifically, why President Trump and General Flynn chose 4chan, which turned to 8chan, which turned to 8 Coon, for the very specific personalities of people that congregated there that already questioned the narrative, that were great at social media, that were great at making memes, that already had all these things they needed for digital soldiers, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so there are a lot of people that argue that, you know, well, 8, 8chan was just there. Are, I, I love the blanket racist term that everybody uses now for anything that they don't like. Um, it really is. It's the last free speech spot on the Internet, right? It's the last one that won't be platform people. It's the last one that people say whatever they want. And you've got to have thick skin to congregate there because if you say something stupid, boy, they will pile on you. Oh, yeah. It's just people that have – and it, there's a reason it's called weaponized autism, right? Because there are a lot of people that really, they are singular focused and they don't care about your feelings. They don't, if you say something stupid, they're going to let you know if you're adding to the fight, then great. They'll love you. But if you're not, then just shut up and lurk. Um, But in that last article in the president Trump, uh, Jay Sakun on the plane to save the world, I went through and I actually talk, go into great detail about the timeline about, you know, there was President Trump actually showed up on 4chan and posted on 4chan once. And, you know, a lot of people didn't believe it was him. So somebody said, hey, I want you to use this word in the next day. And sure enough, within an hour, he used that specific word in a tweet about Colorado. And there have been multiple instances of people telling Q to have the president say, use a word that doesn't make any sense, that doesn't fit. And sure enough, within several hours, President Trump will make a tweet, make an announcement, or give a speech that has that word in it. And this has happened at least a dozen times, yeah. which it's just phenomenal. But for HN, I, I think that is, right? Because there are people that are that they can say that it's about something else. But really, if you look at the popularity, if you look at how much Q has gotten into the public domain. If you look at how many people are following, follow, following now, and you look at how many MSM articles have been written bashing Q, calling him a lark, calling it a dangerous conspiracy theory. Right. But the fact that not one of these journalists or reporters has taken the 30 seconds it would take to ask President Trump, is this real? Because by the tweets, by the words, by the fact that he's been on 4chan, posted the ones, and then worked something in a brew with him. He is the one person we know is absolutely connected to this. Yeah. And so to be a journalist and write an article about it and not take the moment to ask him. And that's Mark McCallum and yep. Maria Barroma within the last week or two, both of them, hey, what should I ask President Trump? And you look at the replies on those, and they got who is thousands. You? Yep. <laughs> who is you? And they would not do it. And you get, at this point, it's comical. And that's why it's a huge joke that they won't ask the Q because they know. Um, like, what, what? how could you responsibly be a journalist and write an article calling Q uh, just a, a baseless conspiracy theory and not ask the one question that could definitively answer that of the one person who can definitively answer that? I would love, um, love to so get yeah. Trump's answer on that one. Uh, that would just be I, one, one of, the, one of these days. Actually, somebody will ask I you. Had to, because I've written a couple articles, I had the CEO of Heroes Media Group uh, try to reach out a couple of times and say, hey, we got the guy that wants to write an article, he wants to interview, he wants to ask a question. Uh, but so far, no takers. I think it has to be a CNN or a WAPO or one of them. But we just got to keep pushing on. But at this point, I mean, it's it really is comical. They just won't go and ask it with as many people that obviously want to hear that answer. It is, and it's so easy for them to dismiss, yet so difficult for them to disprove, ultimately. Um, but that never stops them, in general. <laughs> We've seen them tell more than enough lies over the last several years, and probably over the course of our lifetimes. Um, but, uh, you know, Robert... Uh, I, I, 
People are waking up, man. They they really. I was driving the other day and I saw a utility truck that had a "Where We Go One We Go All" sticker on the back <laughs> of it. I was like, "What is going on?" This is. The, I think that was when it really clicked with me that there are a lot more people out there that believe in this um, than than I think most people are aware. But I got to thank you so yeah, much for for your time here, Robert. I don't want to cut you off there, but if you've got anything to plug besides the book on the way out the door, I'll remind everybody now: thepackedbook.com. Check it out. The first two volumes of the series are out. And you said the third one's coming soon, but if you've got anything else, go right ahead and tell the people. Uh, yeah, I'm hoping to have the third one to my editor by the end of the month. There's another one called Justice Incorporated. Uh, that's about a small town in Texas that gets invaded by a uh, cartel and gang members and a family of veterans and regular Joes decide they're not going to let their families be targets anymore. That should be out shortly after the fact. So in the next three months, I should have two books out. Um, the first book I wrote was Love Me When I'm Gone. It's a uh, nonfiction about my time in special forces in Iraq and Afghanistan and Africa. Um, that's a fun one. And actually, all of my fiction ties into the nonfiction. Uh, and I just, I had this idea when I started writing that people would all read the nonfiction first and kind of get the baseline, but it doesn't work out that way. Okay. Um, but if you do read them all, Love Me When I'm Gone is kind of the origin story for everything that comes after it. Um, so I, I, I just suggest that to people where, uh, it helps make a lot, a lot of things click a little bit more. Uh, but yeah, that's it. Let me, when I'm gone, uh, the pact and I'm at Robert P. Lewis on Twitter. If you want to listen to me rant about, uh, how much I love president Trump and how much I hate the deep state. Uh, that's pretty much what I talk about and a little bit of finance investing everyone's well. <laughs> there you go we have all those things in common it's magnificent um so yeah, you could follow him robert p lewis on twitter and uh follow me on twitter at right opinion pod for that matter and I, I gotta just thank you again so much for your time you've been more than generous i think i took about twice as long as i was expecting to and and you, you, you were just more than generous with the time so thank you again hopefully have you on uh at some point in the future as obviously the the news cycle is just so crazy and maybe who knows maybe we'll find out what the deal is with q and i would love to have you back on to give everybody uh, the big old i told you so um <laughs> so thanks again yeah, robert I think just it's coming. yeah i I, I, it's coming soon. I hope you're right i'm thinking <laughs> thinking right after re-election would be a really nice time to pull the trigger but you know it's just me anyway <laughs> so thanks again and uh and and for all of you out there like i said follow him on twitter follow me on twitter and check out all the books the pack.com love me when i'm gone and uh and obviously keep an eye out for the books to come in the next few months and at this time, I'm obligated to tell you that opinions are like assholes. Everybody's got one, but this asshole has the right opinion right here on the right opinion.podbean.com. I'll talk to you guys next time. Peace.